connection with SVT and Media Exchange, thanks to them. Uh, and just a note, I will be opening up for some audience questions at the end, so please do be thinking of some great questions while I talk to Sally a little bit first. Uh, Sally is an English writer, director, producer, best known for Happy Valley, Last Tango in Halifax, Scott and Bailey. Her next series, Gentleman Jack, is one of the most anticipated British shows of 2019. It's with BBC and HBO about the famous 19th century diarist Anne Lister. And I'd love to welcome Sally to the stage. There she is. Welcome. Which sheet, yes. Take the gold throne, I think. Thank you so much for being here, especially we know you are in post-production with Gentleman Jack. So we know you're very busy, and thank you for taking the time to come chat with us. Uh, I wanted to start way back when you were growing up in Yorkshire and started loving TV. What were you loving? What were you loving about it? Um, can you hear me? Oh, good. Just checking. Um, I loved everything about TV. As a child, I watched um, TV all the time. I never did anything else, to the point that my parents thought, you know, I needed help. Um, so I, I was very indiscriminate about what I watched. It was a kind of an obsession. I was obsessed with the small screen uh, from an early age. And I've never, wanted to, I've never wanted to write a film. I have always been very orientated towards writing TV. Why was that? Why TV, not film? I, I, I wasn't taken to see films as a child. It wasn't on my kind of... Um, Agenda. I think I, I think I was taken to the cinema about twice. I remember going to the cinema like twice as a child. Oh. Um, whereas the TV was just there all the time. It's like my best friend, you know. Um, so I guess that's why. Um, um, I, I I I find it a bit. I'm, I'm very heartened at the moment that TV has stopped being, uh, you know, the poor little cousin of film. It's kind of come into its own to the point where a lot of film people are now trying to get into television. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. <laughs> and what kind of shows were you watching and were you liking when you were growing up and teenager? And um, I, st I did start to become more uh, sort of um, discriminating as I got slightly older. And the, 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 there was one show on that really made, really uh, landed for me, which was called Rock Follies of 77. This is about 300 years ago. So nobody here probably has even heard of that show. Um, but um, it was about a female rock group in the 1970s and it was the first time I'd seen women on TV being swearing and being bad-tempered and opinionated and behaving badly, I suppose. And that, that just really spoke to me. Why wouldn't it? You know? um, and then there was another show called The Duchess of Duke Street and again, that, looking back, that was about a, um, a, a, an unusual woman who... Um, was from a very ordinary background in, um, I think it was in Edwardian England, and she ended up running a, her own hotel. And it, again, it, a, a character with immense um, personality mm. and complexity, and uh, that had a big impact on me as well. And were you listening out for dialogue even back then, do you think? No. No. No, I was, I think. Enjoying it. I was just. Um, I, 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 I did consciously look for shows with women in them who were interesting because t TV was, as it still is to some degree, dominated by male characters. So it was quite a novelty having a, a woman playing the lead. It was a novelty having a character who was a woman who wasn't just someone's wife or blah, 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 you know, the usual. Um, so that did always interest me. I always felt... I always wanted to write for women. Hmm. Um... I think, on a, I didn't analyse that, I didn't think about it, but it would, that was what interested me most. And I, I always assumed that was because I'm a woman and I think like a woman, and so I want to write like a woman. Fair enough. I yep. need more of that. <laughs> <clears throat> you started, well, uh, early in your professional career, you were working for The Archers, which is the yep. long-running serial radio show. Yep. And then um, you wrote for Coronation Street, which is, again, a long-running TV soap mm. in the UK. Um, what what about that? Those jobs have helped you in your career. Did it help you hone a sort of style of working and just the need to churn out? 
Yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier about discipline and how important that is. And when you work on a soap, that's the first big thing you learn is discipline. It's about, um, you know, you, there isn't a huge budget. And one of the biggest things I learned writing The Archers, The Archers is a, a radio soap in England. It's been going for 60 years. And 30 years ago, I was writing it. And um, the first thing the producer told me was, you've got five scenes in every episode. Every episode is 15 minutes long, five scenes. You, you can have seven characters. You've got to use each of those seven characters twice. And you've got to try and use more than two characters in each scene, right? Do so, the math. That's quite tricky. Yeah, it was, <laughs> but it was brilliant. It was yeah. brilliant advice because that they honed that down and studied it. And it, over the years, they'd realised that, that if you stuck to that, it, made a, it was a good structure for an episode. Mm. So it automatically gave the episode a backbone. So that, and that was... Um, one of the first things I learned on that was structure. Uh, when I moved on to writing Coronation Street, one of the biggest things, the most important things I learned there was how important story is and how important it is to, you know, that story is something you have to work really hard at. Mm. And were there interesting female characters that you were writing then on those shows? Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you write a soap, uh, you have to write... You're given an episode and you have to... Um, tell the story of what's happening in that episode. The great thing about writing a show like Coronation Street, which was, ex it was a really good show uh, in, in the 1980s, 90s, and into the early part of this century. It was, it was, it was better than all the other soaps by miles. It was, um, it was a really yeah. good, solid production. And um, so you had to write what you were given in that episode, but because it was such a confident show they allowed the writers a lot of freedom. So if you tick the, if, if there was a story you weren't particularly interested in, even if it was big, if you, t if you tick the box of telling that story, you could go to town on a smaller story that you might be more interested in. So, um, I, I mean, I didn't particularly think, oh, I'm gonna, it was, it was about writing for interesting characters rather mm. than women. So if there was a character that interested me, who was doing a little story, whether it was a man or a woman, I'd, I'd run with that story more than, a big story that might be with a character that I didn't like. Mm. <laughs> and while you were working on Coronation Street, is that when you started having <coughs> the idea for At Home with the Braithwaite's? Um, I've kind of been working on the Braithwaite's since I was about 18. It was like, because it, <laughs> it was my own family. Okay. So I, it, it was kind of based on my own family. So I, in various different sh for, forms, it had been in my mind for, uh, uh, you know, about 20 years before I wrote it. How did your family react? I didn't tell them. No, <laughs> you um, didn't tell them it was them. <laughs> they might have worked it out. <laughs> I think my mum thought that Alice and Braithwaite was based on her, but I don't think my dad, I don't think it occurred to my dad that the dad was based on him, or my sister was based on any of them. But, and that took a lot of liberties as well and disguised yeah. them a bit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump ahead quite a bit to Happy Valley. Mm. Um, I know you've done lots of other work in between. Go to IMDb, you can see all the shows. Um, but Happy Valley, I think, was the first one maybe a lot of people in this room will have sure. seen. Yeah. Um, where did the germ of that idea came from? And I'm, I'm curious if it starts with the character, the setting, the plot. Mm -hmm. How did that one start for you? It's, it's quite tricky to remember. I think... It's a while ago now, but the BBC basically... I'd, I'd had Scott and Bailey on ITV, which was a quite successful cop show uh, set in Manchester about two female detectives. And the BBC basically asked me to write a police show for them. So I tried to think of a way I could write something dif very different from Scott and Bailey, and the obvious difference would be to write about a uniform officer rather than a detective. Mm. So that was kind of the starting point. Um, and then I met... Um, an old school friend, Lisa, who was a police officer, and just got chatting to her. And she and I just cooked up ideas together, uh, developed stories based on that. Um, it, it's, I, I honestly can't remember where a lot of the background of it came from. I mean, it's like a lot of these things, it's just hard work. Yeah. I mean, the central, the starting point was Catherine. The starting point was, uh, I wanted to write something else for Sarah Lancashire, who'd been yeah. in Last Tango. Um, I'd been asked to write a police show and um, the, the rest was just coming up with the whys and wherefores of who this character was and why she was in the situation she was in and that kind of thing. 
And she's such a wonderful actress. Um, mm. We come to think she's sort of synonymous with, with your work now. Um, what do you like about her as an actress, especially when you were writing Catherine? Why did you know Sarah could um, do this? Well, one of the biggest things for me is always humour. Mm. I always think however dark your stories are, um, humour is always important. And Sarah absolutely has the same opinion. And so she, she's this very talented, um, serious actor, but she's also extraordinarily funny. She can be extraordinarily... Um, just, just funny, she can make you laugh effortlessly. And I, I just thought that was a really fantastic combination. Oh. Um, and it's, I think she, she's a northerner like me as well, so she kind of gets the rhythms of the language. Um, I remember when we did the first series of Last Tango, mm. uh, she kind of told the director off and she said, if you, if you direct it like that, it just won't work. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, it, and it was to do with the rhythms of the language, I mm. think, so, um, yeah. I think we have a clip of Happy Valley. It's not a funny one. <laughs> um, but I would love to just remind people who have seen it um, just quite what it's like. Um, we'll show the clip. If you're watching it on Netflix right now and you're not up to series one, episode four, you might want to close your eyes. Spoilers ahead. But we'll take a look at a sequence from Happy Valley, please. I will say, if you haven't seen the whole show, it's not all quite that visceral. No. There's moments with a lot more talking. It is quite dark, Happy Valley. Yeah. Yeah, Happy, the Happy Valley might be ironic title in this case. Um, well, no, it isn't actually. It, no. Um, it's what the police call the area. Oh, okay. Because of the drug problem. Ah, okay. And... It is ironic as well. It works on two levels, obviously. I think it's great to see something that's a show like this not set in London, not even in Manchester or York. You know, why, why is it that sort of smaller community of interest to you as a writer? Um, I, it's not a choice. It, it's not a conscious choice. It was just something I sort of realised I did was I was more comfortable writing in my own vernacular where I grew up. Just because I think if it's your own voice, it's your own accent, it's your own piece of the earth, you, it, you can get, it can be more subtle, it can be more complex, you can get more out of it. And I do often think some of the best shows recently have been shows that are very specifically placed in um, particular areas. Breaking Bad's a good example of that. The Killing, you know, when The Killing came to England and it was so, it was so fresh, it was so... Um, new, it was, we're so used to seeing like generic America, generic London. It just felt very new when mm. um, shows like that hit the screen. And so I think it's a strength, not, uh, you know, it doesn't, just because it's set in a small place, it doesn't make it parochial. You know, yeah. you, can, you can have a, an epic story, can, it has to be set anywhere, somewhere. Mm. So, you, you know, the more particular you make it to people's lives, I think the, the more power it can have. Did any execs ever try to say, oh, set this in London or set it in New York? Or no, what they no. did say was you could set this anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about the, the sort of rhythm of the language as mm. well. And, you know, while you're writing, are you sort of voicing that out loud or it's just in your head? Do you... No, um, I don't. I, I hear things in my head and um, I don't, I don't uh, you know, I don't. I don't act out things out loud in my office. No, okay. I mumble to myself a bit now and again. But, uh, <laughs> no no, I hear it all in here. Yeah. I never read it. I, I know people often say this, that you should read things out afterwards mm -hmm. to see if they found, sound real or not, but I, I kind of know they do. So mm. I, don't need to, I don't need to embarrass myself by <laughs> reading them out loud. It's just you in the office. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, we're hearing about strong female characters now so <clears> much. <throat> in this era of Me Too and a little bit beforehand. Mm. Um, do you sort of think about that strong female character? Are you thinking it just about a complex female character? Yeah, I, I, I like to think of them as complex characters rather than strong. I used to get criticized for writing strong men and weak, strong women and weak men. That's and that, fine. 
Well, it's, yeah. But it, <laughs> it, it pissed me off because I don't think I write weak men. I, yeah. I think people said that because the focus was on women and people weren't used to that. And when I do write men, I hope they're not weak. They're just as hopefully as complex as the women. It's just they're not centre stage. Yeah. Um, and I think strong women implies that there's that there there's nothing wrong with them. They're just great. And I like to write about people who are flawed, people who've got issues and problems and who aren't perfect. I think that's where drama comes from. Mm. Drama comes from you know when things aren't right. And um, so so a character like Catherine, she's she's obviously deeply flawed. You know, on on many levels, she's very unlikable. But we like her because you know. We like Sarah, because Sarah has that compelling quality mm. where she can get away with really challenging the audience. Mm. And was it ever issues in your career that people just didn't want to hear shows centered about women? Did you find that maybe earlier on or at any mm. stage that... No, I mean, <clears throat> I would never present a show as saying, oh, is this about is about woman? women. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I hope it's about story. It's about, it's about whether people are interested in the plot or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the, the thing that um, would excite commissioners. Yeah, I think Last Tango in Halifax was a, another one that, I mean, it's got strong men in it as well. Well, it's by the nature of it, it's well, interesting strong, okay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> interesting, complex men and women. Um, and was this one inspired by your mother? Yeah, it was based very much on my mother. Um, yeah. Last Tango, my mum, my dad died in 2001, and my mum came to live with me and my husband in Oxford. And um, my sister came down to stay and put her on Friends Reunited and she got in touch. She looked at who she'd been at school with and I think there were about three people. She was 73 by this mm. point. And there were about three people on there who'd been in her class at school. And one of them was this guy, Alec. And I think, I, think, I don't know who got in touch with who first, but it turned out he was living quite near because he also was widowed and he also had come down south to live with his daughter. And um, so they got in touch with each other and he asked her out for a cup of tea and they fe she fell in love with him. She couldn't quite remember who he was when he started <laughs> emailing. But they went out for this cup of tea and she fell in love with him. And it turned out that he'd always had a bit of a thing about my mum at school. So it was, we it was amazing. They really did fall in love with each other and it was very uplifting and sweet. And I remember going to um, a storyline meeting about something else, probably Scott and Bailey, and telling the exec I was working with at the time that this had happened, and she said, oh, that's a six-part series. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been more than six parts. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a clip of Last Tango, so are we okay to show the Last Tango in Halifax clip, please? That, that is, I haven't seen that for a long time. And it's quite funny because I did actually have that conversation with my mum. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when she says, I'm talking about sex, I'm going, <laughs> really didn't like yeah. So that yeah. brings back painful memory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I love about that show is it's treating these older people as real people, not just sort of a caricature, bumbling old lady or old yeah. man. Yeah. Did you enjoy writing about that generation? Did, is it any different? Yeah, very much so because. Um, and Annie's brilliant, the actor who yeah. plays Celia. Um, just because it was, it, it's nice, it was, because it was based on my mum, and I have a very close relationship with my mum, and she will say anything to me. And she'll swear where she wouldn't normally swear to people, because she knows it gets a laugh. <laughs> um, so I, it was very... Um, I felt very free and easy and truthful, and I felt I could be really... Um, that, it's really interesting seeing that because it does feel like, uh, not that I, you know, Sarah's not me exactly, but um, uh, it 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 does feel like the kind of conversation I would have with her, and it's very, it's just it's quite therapeutic, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> it feels very real. Th those kind to of watch. conversations. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they're very good performances. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk a little bit uh, about your next show, which is very exciting, Gentleman Jack. It's about this 19th century diarist, Anne Lister. Uh, you shot part of it in Copenhagen, I believe, a little bit. We did, we shot part of the final episode in Copenhagen, because okay. Anne Lister was a great traveler. She traveled extensively in Europe, and um, 
she always wanted to go to Russia, St. Petersburg and Moscow, and this was kind of the first leg. Although she had to come back, she couldn't go on to St. Petersburg as she intended. But she did live in Copenhagen for about six months. Mm -hmm. so. and tell us a bit more about Anne Lister and why this was a story you wanted to tell now. Um, well, I've been, I've been working right. on it for 20 years. Okay. So You've been I, I did for pitch years? it originally yeah. um, quite a while ago, but the time wasn't right, and the time is right now, and so it's been made, which I'm really excited about. <clears throat> so Anne Lister owned Shibden Hall in Halifax. She was born in 90, uh, 1791, and she died in 1840. And when she was 35, she inherited Shibden Hall, which isn't a massive house, uh, it's 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 you know a posh old house, but it's not Downton Abbey. It's not massive. It's really quite modest. And she never had enough money. She was always um, on her uppers. Oh. But she was an extraordinary woman. She was ex phenomenally intelligent, and she was extraordinarily physically fit. And she was she was a great polymath. She was a science a scholar, a scientist, um, uh, a great traveller, a great linguist. Um, she. Um, sank her own coal mine, so she was a great industrialist, which is a large part of what the story is about. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> most famously, she wrote this extraordinary journal, which is huge. It's a, it's a massive journal. It's five million words. It's 26 volumes, seven and a half thousand pages. A uh, sixth of it is written in a secret code. That's fun for you, yeah. That was, that was <laughs> hard work. No, it was fun. It was good. Um, and the other famous thing about her is that she was gay. So her... The, the, the main part of the drama is about her uh, marrying Anne Walker, who was a neighbouring heiress who owned the Cronest estate, which was next door to the Shibden estate. And unlike the Shibden estate, Cro the Cronest estate was massive. It was huge. Anne Walker was very rich. And she kind of married her for, for her money. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a great story in 1832, a woman marry not just marrying another woman, but marrying her for her money. <laughs> Um, but it's more than that. It's the first lesbian gold digger, I would <laughs> say, yeah. yes. Um, so it's, it, it is a love story. It becomes a love story. Anne Walk was always completely dazzled by Anne Lister. But the, 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 across the, the eight episodes of the drama, it's about how Anne Lister realises that she's falling for this um, mm -hmm. uh, quite vulnerable younger woman who she initially was quite cynical about, but who she actually ended up being... Um, unhinged by, as she called it. And with, you know, this big life, this huge amount of existing <coughs> archive material about, or that she wrote, how do you decide what to include in her life and what not to? I knew I wanted to write about her in 1832, so the diary started in 1815, so there's a lot of diary that I haven't used. So um, I started looking at the journal in about um, April 1832, and initially I was working on it on my own, so I was transcribing the journal and in the code as well, and then turning that into drama. So that it was taking me about two months to write each episode. Um, after I'd written about three episodes, I got an, an analyst ac academic on board, um, Anne Choma, who also reads the code. So she was transcribing the journal for me. So I could bypass that part of the process. But I still had to analyze and then um, a big part of it was deciding what to leave out rather than what to, to put in. Yeah, yeah. but it's <clears throat> it's not it, you know it's not like a a dramatization of a novel. It's a diary, so it's actually quite. It, she's not telling you a, a story in the way that a novel is. She's, she's not presenting her. you with characters. Yeah. Well, she do, sorry, she does present you with characters, yeah. but it's very selective. You mm. know, she'll uh, and certainly with the mining story that was quite complex to unravel because she'll tell. Because she's writing it as an aid memoir, she, she writes down what she needs to know, yeah. forgetting to tell me what I need to know. Yes. Uh, that leaves you some space, though, which is interesting, <laughs> yeah. yes. But it was, quite, it was quite a piece of detective work, working out oh. a lot of what she actually meant. Even though it is very explicit, there's still a lot that... She, she'll miss out salient things that she just knows, so she yeah. doesn't need to put it in the journal. So how many years were you researching all this? Um, I think for the first season, we covered... About 18 months. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm thrilled to say that we actually have a sort of world premiere, a little clip of the show, but I also have to say quite carefully that um, this is very confidential. Um, it's, you know, for HBO BBC and the producers' lookout points said, you know, 
please don't mention this on social media, and certainly don't try to film it. And as you will also see, it's got a giant watermark with Jenny's name on it. So if you do film it, Jenny goes to jail. So <laughs> another reason not to film it, but uh, we are thrilled to be able to have a little look at Gentleman Jack. So let's play that. So is there a bit of addressing the camera throughout, or that was just a... Yeah, I debated long and hard about that, because I know it's quite a fashionable thing to do at the moment, but for me it was about how the journal talks straight to us. Yeah. When you read the journal, it is like Anne Listry's talking straight to you. That's clever. Yes. And it felt like that was one way of expressing that. Oh. I know it's not a direct correlation, but that was the... I felt it was justified in that... Mm. When you read the journal, you really do feel that you've got this um, very close connection to her. And that was the sort of TV equivalent of a, um, having that language yeah. with the reader, I suppose. Hmm. Really cool. And it, you know, it felt quite sort of sparky, so it doesn't feel like an old dusty Good. That's costume. what I was doing for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's going to air on the BBC, I think, Easter or somewhere around yep. that? Yes, as much as I know at the moment. Yeah, okay, exciting. Could there be another series of that? I hope so, that would okay. be my... Yeah. You know, it's, it's in the hands of the audience okay. now. Yes, so if you watch <laughs> it, you can get a season two. Um, and I'm personally still waiting for Happy Valley season three. What's going to happen? You're so busy with so many <laughs> projects, but you said you might be interested in a season three. Yeah, there's definitely um, an intention to write more and more Last Tango, hopefully as well. But okay. um, it's it's just finding the time to do yeah. everything at the moment. And I should mention one thing that keeps you busy is you're also directing. Yeah. You know, you've been directing some of some of all these shows, and you know, directing some of Gentleman Jack. Mm. How is that something you enjoy, or is there ever a tension that? Sally, the writer, really loves this scene, but Sally, the director, knows she's only got a half day to shoot it and it's not going to work. Is there <laughs> ever tension in directing your own material? Um, no, I mean, for me, it's, I've, I've always wanted to direct and it was just a, a matter of finding the right time to do it. Mm. Um, but, I mean, it does compromise writing time. Yeah. I mean, I've been working on Gentleman Jack now for two and a half years and it's the only thing I've written and directed in that time. There's been no time to do anything else. Yes. So but, it, but, but for I me, it's a natural that. progression. I think, uh, I, I know some writers like to just write things and hand them over to other people and, and walk away. And I just never been comfortable doing that. I've always felt that I've done half the job. And it always feels perverse to me that you spend so much time, thought, so much of your life working on this, these scripts and then a whole bunch of other people come in and you're no longer part of the process. Oh. I always found that quite tough, and um, and I love directing. I, I I think I love it more than I love writing. Oh, um, I think it's, <laughs> um, it's it's hard. It's tough. It's, it's less lonely. Tough. It's certainly less. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly less lonely. Yeah. When you do sit down to write, <coughs> do you have, you know, a shed in your garden, you go sit in at 6 a.m. every morning, or what's your process like when you need to go have um, some writing time? I tend to get up really early, like I'll get up at like 2 o'clock in the morning. What time? 2. My God. Yes, all right. Um, no, because if I can work from 2 till 7, I can do a lot more than if I work from 9 till, uh, you know, 4, four yeah. But I think then my brain just is just more alive, more awake. stay awake the rest of the day? What happens? No, I, I try to keep <laughs> going. <laughs> but it, get, it, it gets gradually slower and slower as the day goes on. Oh. So by four o'clock, I'm still staring at the computer, but I'm like brain dead. Yeah. But you, you are someone who can just sit down for hours and not get distracted and not get up and make too many cups of tea and uh, just sit there and do it. I do make a lot of tea. Okay. That's, well... You've been up uh, since 2 a.m. You're going to need the tea. <laughs> but yeah. no, I think I'm, I am, I do put the hours in, but they're quite okay. erratic hours. Okay. I, 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 could, I could never do nine to five. I, no. I, uh, I, tend to, I tend to do it when I feel like it, but fortunately I feel like doing it most of the time. Right. So. And if you're ever just really stuck, what do you do? Do you go for a walk? Do you leave it for a week? Do you, um, what happens? I'm not sure I have ever really been stuck. I think, I think... The idea of writer's block is a bit of a... I don't think it exists. 
Um, I think writer's block is when you don't know what comes next. And that's usually because you've not really thought your stories through properly. So I think if you've thro thought your stories through properly, you, will, you, you won't get stuck, it'll flow. And if you do get stuck, it's, it, you have to go back, you have to look back at what you've not done right in your prep. So when you're starting a, maybe a series of a show, a season, do you sort of outline the whole thing and then go back and fill it in? So you um, I try to. <clears throat> I, I kind of have two, two documents. One would be I'd do a really detailed scene breakdown for the episode I'm currently working on. And then I'd have a series document that will become more and more fleshed out as I work through the episodes that I'm writing. Okay. Wow. It's so impressive. Yes, <laughs> what you writers do. Um, I thought it'd be a great time to open it up for some questions. Any questions from the audience? Raise your hands. You've got Sally Wainwright here in Gothenburg, people. No, no question. Hands. They're too scared. Is anybody yeah. up there? Great, I can go. Oh, no. Hey! Yes, please. Katrina has a question. Hi. Uh, just wondering if you could talk a bit about um, collaborative writing, which of course is sort of the big thing these days. And you know, when we were talking earlier, you don't really, you know, do that. What, what um, would would interest you to do in in a collaborative way? Um, I don't. I've never. I've rarely worked with other writers. I mean, occasionally writers have come on board my shows, like Scott and Bailey, to write one or two episodes, but my closest collaborations tend to be with advisors, like police advisors, police um, experts, who I've worked on shows with. And on Gentleman Jack, I work very closely with the historian I was working with. So those are very, often very creative, uh, useful relationships. Would the idea of a writer's room just not sit with you? Do you think you would enjoy that kind of process? Well, when I worked on soaps, ongoing soaps, yeah. um, like Coronation Street, that would yeah, you, you know, you're in a room with 15 other people. Mm. Um, but um, no, the idea of the writer's room I, would not be a thing for me. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Are there... Oh, yes. Um, I think we can pass the mic to you, this gentleman there. On the <coughs> yeah, hello. I was just wondering, would you ever consider to direct anything someone else has written? Um, yeah, I mean, I have done. I've directed on stage other people's work. Um, I would, I would like, I would consider it. Yeah, but I, it, it, for me, it's a question of time because it takes me so long to write my own stuff. Um, I suspect I would never have time to uh, write and direct someone else's work. So, I, um, if, if somebody sent me a script and I loved it, I would definitely go for it. Yeah. I think it'd be, and, but I'd be scared of le about letting another writer down and doing a bad job of their work. Oh. I'd be more likely to say to the writer, no, you direct it, you'll do a better job than I will. I wish more writers directed, I think. Yeah. And if she directs should. your film, it means we don't get Happy Valley 3, so. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> and we've got a question right here in the front with Helen. Okay, you, you can shout out and I can repeat. <laughs> so the question is that the barrier to get over? Or, or is it just she, so she's praising these female characters a lot of them are badasses mm -hmm. and how do you create a badass is that um, hard <laughs> my question is if there is a barrier to get over a barrier to get over to right yeah, are they sort of organic, yeah. or are you really? I, I I kind of write what I want to write, and the characters that I write that I don't have to get over anything. They they kind of flow pretty naturally, and I think, uh, you know, the more complex, the more flawed a character is, the more interesting they are. So I don't set out to write strong women. And that's you know, which I've been accused of trying to. They can yeah. be bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, they can swear, they can all that. Right? Yeah, but we're, people are complex, aren't they? People are all sorts of things. People can be good and bad, and I think it's, uh, you know, the more complex your characters are, the more interesting they're going to be, and the, certainly the more interesting they're going to be to an actor. So the, more, the better calibre actor you're going to get if you present a character who they can do things with and make choices about and develop things with. So, no, I... I uh, 
I'd, I've never had to get over any barriers to present those characters. With some of these actors that you're working with, um, that was Saran, Saran and um, Gentleman Jack, and obviously Sarah, you've worked with a lot. Are you working with them to div you know, maybe tweak the character a bit as you shoot, or the script? Or do you like to really stick to what's on the page? Um, I don't tweak the characters much. Uh, interestingly, with Gentleman Jack, um, I wrote the first three episodes blind. I didn't know who was going to play Anne. And even though I knew Saran, I hadn't actually, weirdly, I hadn't really thought of her. Um, I don't know why I hadn't. Um, but then she came in to read for the part, which she wouldn't normally do, but because HBO were involved. Yeah. And she just blew me away. And I was just like, why the hell didn't I think of Saran? You know? um, and then it was much easier to write once I knew that she was going to be Anne, because I, I know her voice, I know her mannerisms, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> knowing who is on board to play the character helps me enormously. Mm. It helps me to visualise and it helps me to... Um, it helps me with the humour, mm. uh, knowing that... So, uh, particularly, well, like, like Sarah, Saran's got real good funny buns. She, she can be very dark and she can mm. be very funny as well. So that's great. Yeah, and with somebody like Sarah, is she obviously you've had collaborated a lot over the years, so is, does she ever just come to you and say, I don't think Catherine would say this... Here. No, not really. Um, I mean, there might be a few. We might. It's tiny, tiny Touch stuff. Order on the two. whole, no, they're they're very um, responsive to the scripts. Okay. Mm. Um, and you know, looking at the future, you've got Gentleman Jack premiering. You're still finishing the rest of those episodes. Mm. Uh, but what's next? Do you have some sort of dream projects or new things you want to try? <coughs> I'd like to do something really different. I'd like to. I've never particularly wanted to work in film, but. I'd, I'd like to make a film just for the experience of doing it. I'd like to direct a stage play on a big stage. Mm. Again, just for the experience of a different kind of directing, a different kind of interrogating a script. And that would be doing someone else's. It wouldn't be a stage play that I'd written. So I'd, I've kind of got to a stage in my career, in my life, where I'd, I'd like to just keep pushing the boundaries and not mm. just do the same thing. I mean, that was the great challenge about learning to start directing at the age of 50 was... Just hadn't. I had done it before, but not on this kind of scale. Yeah. And had you ever done any theatre in the past in school or something? Uh, not professionally. I'd done a lot of not professional theatre. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I never. I never actually. I started directing when I was at university, and I never actually stopped. I, I was just doing it on a uh, non-professional level. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what do you like about working in theatre? You know, from from some of that, just the connection with the audience. Yeah. So. I had that it's live. That you get a live response. Yeah. And. Um, an immediate reaction to what you're doing. We've got another question. Yeah, uh, just curious now that you talk about le learning to direct at a, yeah, w whichever age, but um, is that sort of a learning by doing thing? And do you think with writing as well that it's just, just do it kind of approach? Um, I, when I became a writer, I'd never, I hadn't been on any kind of courses. I know there are courses everywhere now, but when I was at university, there weren't. And certainly directing, it's the kind of thing you can probably go on as many courses as you like, but you're not really going to learn anything until you start doing it. Um, it, it, was, it was quite a sharp learning curve. Everybody told me that the first three days would be hell, and then after that it would all make sense, and that really was true. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, it's, 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 it's mentally and physically really exhausting, and it's because you're just learning something every day. I've, I've been doing it for like four or five years now, and it's... It never stops being stimulating because every day there'll be something new that you have to deal with that you'd never dreamt would happen. Um, we're shooting a scene on Gentleman Jack where one of the characters had an accident with a piece of glass. And I'd spent so long with the makeup um, department thinking about how this injury would oh. emerge. Uh, so one of the makeup guys had rigged up, uh, you know, a bottle with blood in it and a tube that was fastened to the actress and all this. And on the day, it just didn't work and it didn't look right. So I thought, I'm not going to do that. It's going to look stupid. And what I hadn't thought about is that when she inflicts this injury on herself, she has to fall over. So I hadn't got a crash mat in. So it's things like it's stupid little things like that that you think you're learning more and more and more, and then something can come along to bite you that you just for all the massive prep that I put in, I hadn't thought about something as simple as a crash mat. So it's it's quite a every, every day is very exciting. <laughs> and do you still feel like you're learning as a writer as well? Still learning. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't, you never stop learning. 
you never stop because every every new scene is a challenge every new project every <clears throat> every new scene breakdown every new i mean like people ask me what my process is now kind of i kind of don't know i've never analyzed it so every new project is a new challenge and it needs a new approach you know you've got certain uh, things that you have learned over the years but they're all every new project has a new challenge and a new way of dealing with it so it's a constant learning process great well sally wainwright thank you for the shows thank you for explaining a bit more how you work thank you